Hey rockers, I am Artifacts and welcome to the Launchpad Live interviews. Symphonic metal has been a continuously growing genre since the early 90s. Epica was one of the first bands to bring this genre to the front of the metal scene. Albums like The Divine Conspiracy, Design Your Universe and Requiem for the Indifferent have catapulted the band to an iconic status in the metal world. With their eighth studio album, Omega, Epica embarks on their most adventurous release yet. This is the unedited conversation with Simone from Epica. Hello everyone, this is Simone from Epica. And you're listening to 99 WNRR. First of all, how are you doing with, you know, obviously with everything going on and how are you feeling? And I should ask you that question because you're entering history today, right? <laughs> oh, please. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn I, the interview I'm around. Not... I'm going to ask you how you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, wow. Reverse interview. Okay, I'll give you this answer. There is uh, an obvious tension, some of which uh, being of 52 years <clears throat> old, that... Um, I've never seen in my lifetime. I'm sure that my father has never seen in his lifetime because he would have said something. Uh, but yeah, this is, a, and everybody's on edge and we have no idea what's going to go on. Um, we do, we just don't, we have no, no clue on a, on a better note. Uh, I actually just spun the record. I okay. I just spun the record and, uh, wow. Uh, amazing. Amazing. I've, I've been a fan since, since, um, I came in and designed a universe. I heard Unleashed and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> like, what a sweeping <laughs> what a sweeping melody. I was captivated and I've been a I've been a fan since. Um but this record was uh it, it was it's it's different because it's it's sound it feels like your heaviest, but yet it's more melodic, but the but the heaviness is not as far as speed goes, the heaviness is is in is in uh, like riffage and and just just an overall like like heaviness like some of the riffs get dirty and and it, it has a has a, a very great feel and a slightly different. Um, was it something you guys were going for on this record? There was a slight to go a little heavier to go a slight feel. There seems to be a progression over the last few records. Uh, yeah, I guess we we kind of uh, got heavier after. We welcomed two new band members that uh, were previ previously in God Dethroned, Isaac, our guitar player, and Arian, our drummer. And all guys in the band contribute to the songwriting, so everybody writes songs. And that's how we get this great variety of styles. Um, and I think after the Holographic Principle, we had a little break at, from touring. We wrote our... Um, and uh, not our anniversary, <laughs> our biography, The Essence of Epica. And we were kind of reflecting a little bit how we would proceed with a new album. And uh, we decided to not be stressed by touring and everything. So we took a lot of time off for the songwriting, got together uh, as a band in a, a villa in the Netherlands to write together on the spot because um, that's not something that's normal for us because we live far apart and mm -hmm. being together the whole creative process was differently than if everybody would just write on their own in their home studio and we were just sending files back and forth and we are a metal band uh, even though we have very catchy melodies and catchy songs as well we are a metal band at heart and we love to get heavy um and yeah, this this album, I think, I, I'm not sure if it's the heaviest album, but it's the most profound and matured album so far. It covers all the elements that Epica stands for. And with each album, we like to add a couple of new ingredients. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm myself super happy with how everything got together in the end. Also due to the pandemic, we managed to record the vocals in different studios because we couldn't travel. But uh, we never lost our motivation and we wanted to, yeah, with each album, we wanted to make it the best up to date. Was that, was that a motivating factor to record and, and do a vlog with the studio because it was a different approach to the songwriting this time? Well, the vlogs we've done, I think, also with the last album, uh, but not as uh, in-depth as we did it now. 
because we found out the fans love those behind the scenes material and uh, we work uh, together with a uh, videographer since many years now and yeah the, the digital content is now a big factor or uh, you know all the extras that fans want uh, we listen to that and um, but I had to record my my video footage myself because there was no one else there. I had our producer; yeah. he was there on the on the tablet in my vocal booth. <laughs> so uh, he was tiny and square shaped, uh, and there was no videographer except for me. So I just had to film some simple footage here and there. I didn't have a lot of energy or time to do that because recording vocals is uh, very tiring <laughs> yeah um I, yeah but the fans I, love it so that's why that's why we do it and it's also fun for me actually to to watch those vlogs because i live in germany mark lives in sicily and we are not uh, capable to travel to the studio in the netherlands a lot so like this we can also get to witness the whole process a little more I did watch that one, and uh, being in a being in a, in a booth like that myself, um, in that creative process, it's always very. I always felt a little bit more energized when I had you know the, the band around me, everybody in the studio on the other side of the glass, you know the normal. What what was that like emotionally as a vocalist? Uh, did you find that you had to draw more out of yourself? emotionally because the energy wasn't there because of the, the 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 lack of the of the humanity in the room so to speak no not really i'm used to that because the vocal recordings always come at the end the only time where we're really together as a band is writing session like we did it this year and when we do the acoustic recordings that's when we all sit together and play the songs and get uh, get the songs to where we want them to be okay. but for me it this time it was extra draining because of what the the mental pressure of what's going on in the world uh, feeling that things are shifting and that we can't control it and that cost me some some nights i couldn't sleep well so i was extremely fatigued uh in the beginning of the recordings and i had to had to take a little break because i just felt that i wasn't at my best shape and that was merely because of the, you know, the, the, the stress from tours being cancelled, bands going bankrupt and what's happening to the future. And I just, I'm a thinker, maybe an overthinker sometimes, and that keeps me from sleeping sometimes. And that's not the best thing you want for recording vocals. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, 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 you have to be, you have to have, you, you, you kind of gather up all your energy. Um, mm -hmm. For, for every note that you're going to push out with, you know, obviously with, with the emotion that you do on every track. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, I, I found it very interesting that, uh, and you had, you had mentioned in the holographic principle that, that you were, you know, the push to, to work more with a live instrument. And when, the, obviously I was watching you guys through the vlogs and doing the recording and stuff like that. Uh, does that, what does that bring to the table for you? I mean, obviously when I did it, a while back it was you know obviously that was how we did it we did it all live um do you find that in that process uh in the studio and obviously with the songwriting using the live instruments that there's a different feel a more openness um you know there it's not so confined or constricted do, do you mean now that uh of us using the uh, orchestra or instead of samples or yes exactly or like instead of using samples or, or even like a drum machine or something like that or programming that kind of sometimes can be stale and this obviously a more you know a larger sound ethereal it does does do you find that there's a difference and how does that affect your delivery on a song uh well this time we recorded uh, with an orchestra in Prague and mm -hmm. um in the past we have worked with like a violinist um uh, can you say flutist? That's how we say it in Dutch, flutist, mm -hmm. um, and like a smaller string quartet or so, but uh, never a full orchestra. And Mark has a second band, Mayan, and he recorded his last latest album with that orchestra, and they were so pleased with that. And it, you know, it's not so expensive as it is here uh, in the Netherlands or in Germany. So we were willing to invest the money in it because we are in some we are a symphonic metal band. Of course, samples nowadays they are amazing, and we still also use samples. But 
having a real orchestra, you get the little imperfections. The sounds more organic and. Mm. Uh, we've done live shows with orchestra and I myself, I enjoyed it immensely because that's how the music is supposed to sound. But it's unfortunately not possible to do, to tour like that all the time uh, because of financial reasons. Um, yeah. But I think it is definitely a bigger value, added a bigger value to uh, to the music. And same with the choir. This time um, we had a bigger choir plus on top also a children's choir which uh, those were recorded shortly before the lockdown. So that was kind of, um, how do you say, good, with, I don't know the saying in, in English, but, you know, and during bad times, it's the, like the silver lining of the whole thing that we were yes. able to still do that because otherwise it would have, the album would have gotten a huge delay because, yeah, we're living in this pandemic now for more than half a year. <laughs> And uh, that would mean, yeah, the album would not be finished now. But yeah, <laughs> long answer. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the I want to talk about the the record itself, uh, the songs on the record. Um, obviously, yeah. "Fits of Time" is is out now. Um, my favorite song, "Code of Life," by a long stretch. Yeah, my uh, son is, is is also his favorite. He loves yeah. it. My uh, it's one of my favorites too. Yeah, I mean, b between the, the the Arabic and Celtic rhythms and uh, and and obviously the tones and the, and the, and the and the music, dare I say, slightly Zeppelin esque, which I found a kinship with. I liked, uh, but just mm -hmm. the whole, it just there's so many ebbs and flows in that one song. Can you tell us? About, can you tell me about that song specifically? I mean, we can talk about everything. We can do. I want to go to Rivers too, Kingdom of Heaven Part Three, but for some reason, Code of Life jumped out. Um, what about that song? Uh, differs a, a lot from the rest of the album. Well, the the music is written by uh, Kuhn, our keyboarder, uh, who also uh, works on orchestration and also choir uh, arrangements. And he's a huge Disney fan, <laughs> or a huge movie fan as well. Okay. And I myself, when I heard the song the first time, I was like, oh, this reminds me of Prince... Prince of Egypt, and I love the Egyptian feel to it. And um, yeah, the song was written, I think, quite quite fast. At first, it was still missing a, an, an end, but uh, the rest of the band uh, helped Kun with that. And uh, the lyrics, uh, "Code of Life," are about the uh, CRISPR. The g genetic modification, the genome editing, that kind of the song kind of put, uh, throws a light on all the the sides of it, the good and the bad, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, code of life basically stands for our DNA, our human code, our uh, code of life, and that we shouldn't toy with that too much, you know, because yeah it can it can have a bad bad outcome like well, in they, china they, they, they are making the designer babies there uh, <laughs> yeah uh, there's well, already so much happening we don't know about but yeah, i saw the the documentary on natural selection and i was like oh this is so interesting <laughs> it the funny thing is you bring that because uh, in, i think uh, i mean what i felt in the song um there's a lot of almost like a spiritual nature to it um, and since you brought that up, it, it, is it is it kind of like a warning, uh, you know, a warning, so to speak, as to, you know, trust more in something else than the science, so to speak? Is is that kind of what's going on with that song? No, it's it's. Uh, I, I'm not a scientist, but it is for me. It's just, and I'm I'm not a religious person either, you know. But mm -hmm. I do trust in, in natural selection and. You know, uh, of course, if you can eradicate a disease, that that would be wonderful. But if if it goes to the other side where people try to make superhumans and designer babies, um, trying to mess with human nature, I, I don't know, I, or eradicate species, uh, I, th I think that's just, that goes a little too far, in my opinion. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there's good and bad side to it. But if if people can get these experiment kits at home and start experimenting on their own albums, I don't know if that, that is such a good idea. 
with rivers, the skeleton key, the abyss of time, kingdom of heaven, um, the overall concept of the record. If I were to tell somebody, listen to this record, it's called Omega, and there is a uh, there's a con there's a concept behind it. What would you say? Well, it's it's not so so easy to <laughs> to explain in and just uh, two uh, sentences. But Omega is basically a continuation of the holographic principle, uh, where basically everything comes together. You know, you have the Big Bang. That's the beginning, and the Omega point is basically the the end, where uh, everything comes together and um, a big line through the whole lyrics is the balance between light and dark, so yin and yang, uh, the balance between ourselves, you know, there's good, there's evil, and uh, basically trying to restore that balance. And Mark and I both drew inspiration out of the Emerald Tablets. They're some of the uh, oldest wisdom stones known to mankind. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, each each lyric has a little bit the red line, but some of them, of course, they kind of go in a in a different direction. For example, "Rivers" is a very personal song, um, uh, but it's also a metaphor because the river stands for the flow of life, the ebb and tides, you know, and that we sometimes need to swim against the stream when we feel like we're drowning uh, in our within ourselves, and um, uh, the Abyss of Time, you said, is also the battle between light and darkness, between spiritual freedom uh, and the, the demi-urge trying to keep the soul imprisoned and trapped in an illusion. So, um, mm. Kingdom of Heaven is the third part of the Kingdom of Heaven trilogy. That's why we also kind of... Omega doesn't mean the end of Epica, it's basically the end of the, the trilogy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And where, where science and spirituality come together to find the true meaning of life. And that's something I think in all the lyrics is also a recurring theme. What's the meaning of life? And um, yeah, who who am I? Um, what do I want in life? We're all mid-30 or end 30, 40. And you start to ask yourself a lot of questions you didn't when you were in your mid-20s. So uh, I would say this is a very spiritual, profound uh, album with yeah a lot of connecting dots for us for ourselves and hopefully also for uh, for the fans some recognizable parts <laughs> is that something that that is a na i mean obviously a natural progression I mean, when you think about it have you know do you take any moments and say man we've been doing this now for almost 20 years and we you know mm -hmm. the band has been around for almost 20 years and, you know, obviously hugely successful, genre inspiring. And, you know, do you ever take a moment and do you ever sit back and think, wow, look at what we've done so far? Yeah, that was actually the time when we had a little uh, touring hiatus. Because normally we would be touring, writing an album, recording an album and touring at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had, a, yeah, we had a busy lifestyle and we were in this fast train that never stopped and having that touring break working on the essence of epica gave us time uh to reflect on everything that we have achieved and, and long forgotten memories were like uh that were buried somewhere they were, they came up and it's like kind of a epiphany how do you say epiphany Epi like yeah. why or it's crazy all the things that we've done already so far and we're not even hopefully <laughs> halfway through life all the things we've seen the world we traveled uh being able to be a professional touring band and living from it yeah it's a very rare thing and i notice it now as well during the pandemic so many bands struggle big time to keep their head above water and um we we kind of made it. We worked our asses off, and it wasn't always easy. But we are also struggling in this pandemic. But luckily, we still managed to pay the bills somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 across the board, that that is something that so many people, um, you know, and and so many bands that I talk to that are, 
you know, obviously, you know, in that in that moment of of unfortunately, do we do we you know obviously do something else and just to make ends meet? Um, that 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 is the heartbreaking. That is one of the heartbreaking parts uh, yeah. of, of this uh, of of the great bands that are that that can no longer do it. Um, we talk about touring and how much obviously miss it. I mean, that's a that's a rhetorical question. Everybody who who's in you know in a band that knows what it's like to play in front of a large audience and 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 a bunch of and a sea of people. Um, what is that compared to? You know, obviously the beginning of the band for you. Uh, obviously from the you know obviously the last shows that you did. Uh, has has that ever changed for you? That moment when you're ready to go and you hear the first note hit in front of a sea of people, what does that feel like? Yeah, the adrenaline pumps through your body, I guess. You're like, you're ready to go. You are you feel like you're in a cage and somebody can finally let you, can let you, set you free, you know, to go <laughs> to your natural habitat, which is the stage, which is my office, one, one of my offices. But uh, I miss the live shows a lot. Uh, I don't miss the fact that I that I uh, have to miss my family because that's the silver lining. I get to be with my family now, watch my son grow up. And in the past, I was gone a lot. And that was, the, the, the for me, the downside of touring a lot. But there's this thing when you're on stage, the flow of energy going through your body, It's you cannot compare it to anything else. No matter how much I go to the gym, work out, sing in the shower, or take strolls through the... Uh, the forest it's not the same and I feel like I have this energy bundled inside me that's sometimes boiling and makes me feel frustrated and sad but um, yeah I I guess I talked to Tarya about this once and she's like yeah there's probably a lot of musicians going to explode on stage because <laughs> we can finally do what we were made to do and uh, yeah it, it makes me sad because but I know I'm not alone, and uh, so many other artists that were like heavy touring artists are suddenly home. I've been touring since I'm 17. I've never been home this much. I'm used to a, my normal lifestyle is, is being in an airplane and traveling and being in backstages and on the stage. And suddenly that's gone. That's like you have to restructure your lifestyle. You have to find a new routine. And of course, being a parent, you do have, you're more forced to have a routine than other musicians that can just sleep until noon <laughs> that's not the case with us but still you have to structureize your day differently and uh yeah it's I, uh, something uh, we are all struggling with i guess all musicians well yeah no i mean it's it's something that i i when i, I talk to sharon and the, and i talk to elise and 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 every and all of uh, everybody it's the same thing you 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 hear it in in everyone's voice um, mm. of, of how of how this is you know obviously something that no one ever expected at least you know in in a hundred plus years and especially mm. with all the different you know technology and advancements that we have that this thing this something like this would never even occur to be able to shut everything down in the way that it is and being you know creatures of 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 you know this is what we do uh, and this is who not only what we do but who we are part mm -hmm. of our school so to speak and and to have that taken out it's not just you know, I can't go to the office and work. It is a piece of you that is missing. So, and you can hear that. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It's it's like on standby, waiting to be activated. <laughs> and I can't wait. You know, for that for that moment, I can't wait to see you on stage when, to perform this record when it, when we can finally do this. I mean, I saw obviously everything. Uh, I was talking to actually um, Mauricio from Cataclysm, and he actually gave me some intel. On the inside, because obviously he works with, he has a ton of uh, uh, bands that he manages, and obviously working with uh, booking agents as well over there, and says that uh, he told me that he's gotten phone calls to where it's it's not it's going to be until 2022 till we can maybe possibly get back to Rome, which is unfathomable in my in my in my eyes, unfathomable. Yeah, yeah, I I mean we're struggling. Re rescheduling our tours as well uh so and of course everybody has hope that uh, of originally you know normally right now i would be on tour 
And when when you have a new record, you have this cycle that's attached to it, this touring cycle, and that's the cherry on the cake after you've written a new album. Mm-hmm. And now it feels like we're sitting on top of a Christmas present we're not allowed to open. You <sighs> know what I mean? And uh, it's... Uh, and new new stuff's happening every day. You know, you can't plan at the moment, and that's weird. I'm kind of a control freak, and I have no control over this whatsoever. And I have to learn to let it go, <laughs> and go with the flow. You know. Yeah, and and is there is there is there is is it part and parcel to the situation that you know that this is going to be you know we're waiting for a full release until February of next year? Is it just to to wait a little bit and see what happens or, you know, why not put it out now? Well, originally we wanted to put it out now because that's when the tour was planned. And when we found out that uh, the whole touring world was caving in like a, like a house of cards, (laughs) we decided to um, postpone the release, but therefore uh, we will release four singles leading up to the release of the album. Okay. So four of of the twelve songs will be released before the the album, and uh, the first ones released as of time, and we got very po- positive feedback. We we hit like a million views within one week, mm-hmm. so we're very happy with that. Um, we released the artwork, the track list, uh, merchandise is already uh, for sale for pre order, and things are selling out. So. That's that's the good part of it all, and uh, but I know the song since so long, and when I listen to them, I sometimes get a little bit uh, this bittersweet feelings. Like I want everybody to hear it, I want to play the songs live, but uh, gotta be patient. <laughs> patient. <laughs> it, it sounds like you're holding on barely about <laughs> that. You want to get out yeah. there, bad at singing these. Mm. I can hear it in your voice. Um, but you know what? The great thing is, is that we do have music. So, yes. like you said, you've said several times about a silver lining. That would be the silver lining, is that we do have a great album. And it will come out, and people will hear it, and that's the positive part. Yeah, and I hope that the music is going to help people as well, uh, you know, make them feel better in these weird times. I uh, always say music is like the invisible friend uh, for life, you know, that, that's going to help you through ups and downs or uh, accompanying you through life and uh it's like uh yeah it's it's like a mood enhancer (laughs) (laughs) it can enhance all the emotions uh and for me the 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 music has also been a kind of a how do you say uh a, a rock for me to hold on to or you know to kind of vent sometimes or feel again you know when you listen to music you feel things it just activates something in your brain and it's the same when you're watching a brilliant mo- brilliant movie if you switch off the music it doesn't work anymore mm-hmm. i mean music is so powerful and healing and uh i'm happy that we're able to create music and get it out there it's a very it's a special thing yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I actually, I actually mentioned that in in one of my podcasts, not even just a couple of days ago, was the fact of of, of how Im- important the music overall and what it means in in the course of this pandemic and and everything that's going on. It is the the, the one thread that is holding, I think, the whole human existence together for me personally, because it is the one thing that we all can share, that we all can listen to. Um, no matter what your genre, no matter what you you know what you like and what you're listening to, the fact the fact is that it can it gives us our extension to the human emotions of of, of everybody, and yeah. that's the great thing about it. And uh, you know, uh, imagine if this was gone. Imagine if imagine if there was everything was shut down and you and nobody there was no new music. Imagine mm-hmm. that. You know, people I think realize how important. And wouldn't it be great? Someone wouldn't it be great for overall, even for for bands of upcoming bands, that people actually respect music again and 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 see that it's intrinsic value to everything, and you know and go out and buy it and you know and, you know and and you know not try to get something for free, which is so important to artists uh, at, at every level is going out there and purchasing 
you know, the, the content and purchasing the album, purchasing the CD and stuff like that or, or whatever, uh, however they're you know, consuming music these days. Yeah, I mean, the value of music uh, has been decreased by, and, and movies as well, by the streaming, uh, how to say, streaming mediums that I also use. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm also guilty of it, but and back in the day, I used to be this huge DVD collector. I had, my whole wall was like a wall of DVDs, and I invested so much money in it, and the uh, excitement, anticipation, anticipation was huge and nowadays it's like well i'm not going to buy the album's going to be on spotify or no i'm not going to buy dvds i can watch it on netflix and uh it's so sometimes can be a little bit uh demotivational demo knowing that you put so much work in it and with one click everybody can just enjoy it and not pay much money for it like what is our time worth what is our art worth but luckily within the metal scene there are a lot of collectors that really want to have the physical product. So we also take a lot of time and effort in creating special art, physical art for the fans to have as well as, as collectibles. And that's also, uh, I think, a huge thing that helps us get through the pandemic now because, of course, we can't tour. We don't have the income of the shows. We cannot sell physical merchandise, but... Mm. Fans luckily still order merchandise uh, online and the album, I hope, <laughs> as well. But on the other hand, I think music, it has a high value, but there's also a lot of people who can't afford it. And l through the streaming sites, of course, you can choose. You don't have to use Spotify because Spotify pays shit, but there's there are other streaming mediums that to give a bigger share to the artist and like that people with not a lot of money can still enjoy a lot of music and explore music it has a plus side as well because people can by accident or by coincidence discover new bands and then want to go see them play live mm -hmm. so it's it can also have a positive uh, effect on other bands as well but uh yeah, it is sad, kind of sad when you see the numbers, how much a band earns from Spotify plays. <laughs> yeah, I said, that is a completely other conversation, which I would just love to get into. But <laughs> believe me, uh, out of everything that I've seen with and even reading uh, a lot of the uh, uh, a, a lot of the uh, uh, legal paperwork that came from Capitol Hill uh, based on some of the decisions that were made. Uh, would infuriate anybody who's in the industry uh, and not and not getting you know uh, I guess paid justly uh, for for their efforts. So, but like I said that's another that's another time. Maybe that's a forum. Maybe we all get on a call and we talk about that one. But um, I've had a great time uh, talking to you. It's been, uh, it's been we're going over almost into thirty five minutes, and uh, I want to thank you. It's been a great conversation. Thank you as well. I wish you uh, good luck. Thank you so much. I've had a great time. You're welcome. You have a great day. I'll be thinking of you, uh, yes, Americans, yes. <laughs> today. I'll, 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 I'll text you. I'll let you know if those gray hairs come in. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. <laughs> All right, take care. You too. Take care, Simone. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. This is Simone from Epica, and you're listening to 99WNRR.
into that nothingness, came a thought, purposeful, all pervading, so ended the void.